about two years ago, uh, I had a chance to meet the next speaker. And it was not a chance meeting. It was because Monica Sellers, who's one of our regional directors, was hounding me. By the way, if Monica asks you to do something, just do it, because you're going to do it eventually. <laughs> And she was hounding me saying, oh, Rick Green, you got to meet Rick Green. You're going to love Rick Green. You, you got to know Rick Green. You guys should work together. I just think it's, gonna, it's the right thing. to." And literally over months and months and months, she kept saying this. And I had moved to Texas, and it turned out that Rick and I lived, <clears throat> I think it's 54 minutes from gate to gate apart. And finally, it was just like, okay, okay, I will go see Rick Green. And I drove out to Rick's place. And it's funny because Rick, like I said, lives just under an hour from me. We live on a two-lane highway, and it's a kind of a small gated community, and it's a classic Texas white limestone entry pillars with a wrought iron gate across it. That's where I live. So I drive to Rick's place in Dripping Springs on a two-lane highway with classic white limestone entry pillars with a wrought iron gate, and I feel like, this is like coming to my house. <laughs> and I got through the gate and went inside and hung out with Rick. And what I felt like is, I just met my brother. Like, I am in my house. This is like my family. And we literally just immediately fell in love. And what was supposed to be maybe an hour meeting, I don't know whether it was four or five, six hours. I was there all day long, probably until Kara came and kicked me out. Uh, there is a rule now in the Meckler and Green families. Rick and I get in a lot of trouble together. You might have seen us on biblical citizenship. We say things we're not supposed to say. We announce things we're not supposed to announce. We plan things we're not allowed to plan. So the rule in our family is Mark and Rick are not allowed to be alone together. <laughs> I'm proud to say we violate that rule with impunity. <laughs> Rick is another guy that I would call in a firefight anytime. I do, actually. I call on him for advice, for support when I need it. If I get down, Rick's the guy that I'm going to call, and he's going to lift me up. And it's very mutual. And our families have blended together beautifully. The Patriot Academy family has blended beautifully with the Convention of States family. Everywhere I go, people say, I never knew about Convention of States. I'm a Patriot Academy person. I'm a biblical citizenship person. And that's where I first got introduced to you in Convention of States. And now I'm a district captain or vice versa, right? They say, I love Convention of States. I always wanted more. And I love biblical citizenship. Now I'm involved with Patriot Academy. This is the perfect blending of two organizations. It's literally like nothing else I've ever seen in my 12 years being engaged in grassroots activism. So it is my honor, my privilege, and my pleasure to introduce you, my brother from another mother. Mom, I know you'll be surprised. Rick Green. Thank you, Mark. I, I think actually, technically, since Patty and Kara are here somewhere, Mark and I, we could make a lot of plans backstage. I mean, technically, they're here with us, Mark, so we can come up with all kinds of things. But I love being a part of the COS family. I, everything Mark said, I just echo it. Uh, he really is a brother from another mother. And, and I am so excited that my son, Reagan, who's actually right here sneaking off the stage as we go, um, that my son, Reagan, and my soon-to-be daughter-in-law, Faith, are now working for COS and getting the chance to learn under Mark and Patty and, and now, you know, Mike Ferris and the Ruthenbergs. I mean, what an incredible team. And anybody that's a parent, you know, you want to make sure your kids are getting good examples and learning from, from good examples. And I can't think of a, a better place or somewhere that I would want my, my kiddos to be learning from uh, than Mark and, and Patty and their team. So it's just it's great to team up with y'all. All right, so for our limited time, I'm just going to ask you guys, just, just jump in the green family time machine with me. There's enough room for everybody to get a seat. So everybody get in the time machine. We're going to go back in time to New York City on 9-11. Now, it's not the 9-11 you might immediately think of, especially uh, since we just had the anniversary uh, but it's actually uh, long before that. Now, I frankly think we, we should stop off more often at 9-11-2001 and remember what happened. Too often today we have forgotten those things. You know, right after 9-11, if you remember, in fact, we had this renewed patriotism in America. It was actually a healthy response to what had happened. We stood together. Red, white, yellow, black, and brown didn't matter. We weren't hyphenated Americans. We just stood together and said we're fellow Americans and our nation's under attack and we want to defend these values. And, and that renewed patriotism was good, but it, it didn't last very long. And I would argue today that, that as the shock of 9-11 is now just a part of history, 
that instead of renewed patriotism, we need informed patriotism. A patriotism not born out of fear because we've been attacked, but a patriotism born out of an understanding of who we are and what we have. So that when we wave that flag, we understand why that flag is in fact worthy of being waved. So I hate to skip over 9-11-2001, but for this afternoon I want to go all the way back 225 more years to 9-11-1776. And the scene before us as we get out of our time machine is, is a little tent, and, and it's actually the, the first special forces in America. George Washington put together Captain Tom Knowlton's group, and, and, and or Colonel Tom, Tom Knowlton's group, and, and their job was to do some things that other people might not be willing to do. The scene that, that is before us is actually right after the British have already attacked at Staten Island. They defeated us at Long Island, and, and now Washington's dug in. He's trying to figure out, how do I keep from losing all of New York? And as he's trying to figure out what to do, he knows that he needs information. He needs intelligence. He needs to know what's going on on the other side of the enemy lines. He needs a spy. Well, back then, if you were a spy, you were the lowest of the low, the dredges of society. And he needed someone that would step up and volunteer. So Knowlton has gathered his men in the tent, and he's trying to get someone to volunteer to sneak across enemy lines and get the information that they need. No officer there is willing to do so. One of them even says, I'm willing uh, to be shot in battle. I'm not willing to be hung like a dog. And so uh, Knowlton turns to leave. He thinks he's, he's failed in his, his mission. He's not going to be able to tell the general that he's found someone. But as he turns to leave, there's this kid that has shown up late to the meeting because he was sick with a fever. The youngest of all of the officers there, he raises his hand and says, I will undertake the mission. Now this kid's 21 years old. You know his name. It's Captain Nathan Hale. Well, Captain William Hall walks him outside and says to him, you can't do this. This is an impossible mission, first of all. Uh, you're terrible at lying, so you're going to be an awful spy. But if you do this, your family's name will be ruined. You're likely to get caught and be hung. Uh, you're, even if you succeed, your family name will be ruined. There, there's no honor in this. And according to William Hall in his writings later, he said that Nathan Hale said to him, the general needs me, the cause needs me, there is honor in answering the call for freedom. And so he dresses up as a teacher, he sneaks across enemy lines, he gets all the information, the troop movements, the fortifications, stuffs it all down in his boot, he's trying to get back across, he's captured. Well, the evidence is on him, there's no getting out of this, he's busted, and they sentence him to death, he's going to be hung the very next morning. Uh, that night he asked for a member of the clergy, he asked for a Bible, he's refused all of those things. He, next morning and, and throughout the evening, I guess he just somehow found the resolve to do the one thing left that he could do, and right before they hang him, they give him a chance to have some last words, and he gives a uh, he had actually been a, a great orator at, at, at Yale where he went to college studying for the ministry. And, and so he gives this great speech, you know, reciting from Joseph Addison's Cato, essentially giving the reasons for the American cause. And these British troops that are there, they start heckling him. They say, you're throwing your life away. You're wasting your life. And Nathan Hale responds with those words we've all heard. He says, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. There's four different written accounts of what happened that day. Several of them say that he said, I have but one life to lose for my country. Some say one life to lose. The point is, he was willing to give up his life for the cause and would have been willing to do it again. One life to give. You know, I don't know if you're 8 or 80 in this room, but we've all got but one life to give. And the question we've got to ask is, for what will you give your one life? What are we willing to lay down our lives Four. As you ponder that a little bit, let's fast forward a few weeks to the week before Christmas that same year in 1776. And this time we're going to get out of our time machine and we're going to, we're going to kind of sneak over to this guy that's writing right around, uh, you know, he might have been inside a little cabin with candlelight. I kind of envisioned that he was probably sitting around the fire and looking around at little fires with troops around them and, uh, and just taking in the, the devastation that, that we're experiencing at this point. Not only did we lose at Long Island, we lost at Fort Washington. I mean, uh, we're at a point where Washington's troops have deserted him. 90% of them have deserted. He's gone from 25,000 down to about 2,500. The cause is essentially over. No nation is willing to help. Uh, most Americans have given up on the cause. And yet, somehow this kid decides to write these words. So just imagine we're looking over his shoulder and we're watching as he writes these words one week before Christmas, 1776, when it's pretty much all over. He says, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from service to his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Thomas Paine would finish off an American crisis, be published just a couple of days later, and it would change history. It would inspire not only George Washington, but all of those troops there for that amazing crossing of the Delaware in a 
absolute snowstorm and that surprise attack against those Hessian troops that had just defeated them so soundly just a few weeks before. But Thomas Paine knew that he was speaking to a demoralized nation, a demoralized brand new nation. He knew that the odds were against them. And yet he reminded us it's not a summer soldier or a sunshine patriot that wins against such impossible odds. It's winter soldiers. We need winter soldiers today in America. The sunshine patriot that signs up for the cause when it's easy is not going to defeat the evil that we are facing today. This is going to take winter soldiers. In fact, just a, a few months later, Payne would say, I think it was in, in the fourth pamphlet of an American crisis, he would say, those who wish to enjoy the blessings of liberty must, like men, meaning like adults, meaning being responsible, meaning being willing to step up, he said, must, like men, undergo the fatigues of supporting it. In other words, it's not going to be easy. This is going to be difficult. George Mason, just a few months before that, had done the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and in that he said that no free government nor the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people. So no nation, no people, no community, he said, can enjoy the blessings of liberty and enjoy a free government, a free society, unless, he said, they have a, a constant return a fundamental, to those fundamental principles, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Ends up in the, in the Virginia Constitution and in Section 15 of, the, of, of your uh, Declaration of Rights, your Bill of Rights, for those of you from Virginia. And then, of course, Jefferson would borrow from it just a couple of weeks later and essentially copy the Declaration of Independence from Locke's Two Treatises of Government and Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights when Jefferson would pin those words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now take notice at the bookends around the life we all want, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Everybody says they want that, but notice what's on either end of that amazing story of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. First, to get there, you got to hey, you got to say, we hold these truths. You must build the culture and the nation on truths, not moral relativism. There has to be bedrock principles upon which to build the nation. We've abandoned truth in this nation and we're losing life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because of it. We've got to come back to truth first. And then on the other side of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is consent of the governed, the responsibility that comes with those rights, the responsibility to do the very things that you're doing back home, the, the responsibility to say, I'm willing to stand up and give my consent or refuse my consent, the responsibility to actually call out evil in this nation when we see it. And of course, we see it all over the place at this point. It's marching across our nation at a rapid, rapid speed. I remember 22 years ago as a very frustrated state legislator in, in Texas, just watching cultural Marxism already seeping its way into our textbooks in, in Texas. I remember going and testifying at the State Board of Education 22 years ago against textbooks that said, Communism, capitalism, and socialism are just three equal ways to form a society. They were already beginning to water down the beauty of free market enterprise and, 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 and sell the concepts of socialism and, and communism. My, my colleagues laughed at me whenever I passed the Celebrate Freedom Week bill that requires every kid in Texas to study the Constitution and study the Declaration every single year. They thought I was just waving the flag. And then, of course, a few months later, 9-11 would occur. I remember taking on the, 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 the medical industrial complex even back then, fighting for parental choice and vaccines and, and, and never dreamed we would be to the point that we are right now where the medical industrial complex would be forcing things on our children and on, on families and on our entire nation the way that they are. But all of those fights on the front lines, they taught us something. We knew right then we could tell that all of these problems that we're facing, they're just symptoms. They're all symptoms of the real problem underneath, which is biblical and civic ignorance. If we don't know truth, we don't know what to stand for or fight for. If we don't know our history, we don't even know who we are. And so this civic ignorance is the petri dish where bad government grows. And if you have a culture and a society that's ignoring what Colonel Mason told us, and don't forget, I mean, Colonel Mason's the one that, that gave us Article 5 in Convention of States. He was the one that, that was wise enough on September 15th to stand up and say, you've got to have a way to put the federal government back into its box. They'll never do it on their own. So he knew what he was talking about, both with Convention of States and also with just the basic idea that you're not going to have a system worth saving if you don't constantly come back to those fundamental principles. And that's our real pandemic. It's this civic ignorance that we've allowed to grow in our nation. And the good news is ignorance is curable. There's something we can do about this, but we have to come back to truth. Ronald Reagan warned us about this a long time ago. 
You know, we all know the quote. It's been on my website for, for 25 years. Freedom's never more than one generation away from extinction. It's not passed to our children in the bloodstream. It's got to be fought for, and it's got to be protected. You have, to, you have to get it to them, literally instill it in them. You can't just expect that your kid, because they're born in America, they're going to understand freedom. And Reagan knew that. So he talked about the importance of teaching those things. And he also said at the end of that quote, he said, he said if we don't do this, if we don't have a resurgence of, of, of civic literacy and of, of civic practice, he said, there's going to come a day when we spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like to live in America where men were free. I've never thought that was more true than right now. I mean, we are at risk of telling our children and our grandchildren what it was once like. In fact, I'll tell you what it was once like to live in America where men were free. This may shock you, but there was a time in America where you as the parent would decide the education and medical decisions for your children, not some government bureaucrat. There was a time in America, if you're a business owner out there, where you decided to flip that sign from open to close or close the door, not some health official. There was a time in America where pastors out there, you decided when to open the doors of your church and whether or not to sing hymns. There was a time in America where you made the decision of whether or not to wear a face diaper or get an, a, 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 an experimental medical procedure, not some government bureaucrat selling us out to Big Pharma. There was a time in America where we decided not the government officials. And the problem is exactly what Ronald Reagan said. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. And in many ways, America doesn't know who she is anymore. She's experiencing amnesia by not knowing her history. And I think that's why we cowered during COVID as a nation. I think that's why people bowed so easy and gave up their liberty so easy. I think they acted cowardly because they just forgot who we are as Americans. So let me just remind you, Americans are not snowflake, cowardly wimps. Our DNA actually comes from the hardy, mighty men of courage throughout our history. The 70 that stood on the Lexington Green outnumbered 11 to 1 against the greatest military power on the planet. Our DNA comes from those young 17, 18, 19-year-old boys that, that stormed the beaches of Normandy and Iwo Jima and Saipan and all the rest. Our DNA comes from those people in New York, men and women both, that ran into burning buildings to save lives. That's who America is. That's the types of things that we've done throughout our history. You, th you think about those stories and you say, that's who we are at our core, and we've got to shake our, our, our fellow Americans out of their slumber and out of this trance where, where, where they're being led by fear. You remember what Ronald Reagan said when the space shuttle exploded in 86? He said, he said the future does not belong to the faint-hearted, it belongs to the brave. And America will no longer be the land of the free if we don't again become the home of the brave. We've got to be willing to say we're not going to play it safe all the time. I'm so sick of this safetyism that's killing America. Everybody's playing it so safe. We've lost our adventurous spirit. We've lost our willingness to take risk. I, I drove by a, a hardware store just the other day, and the marquee sign said, Safety is our highest value. Safety is our highest value? Friends, if, if your value system is that screwed up and safety is your highest value, you'll cower in the hallway with your ballistic shield and bulletproof vest along with dozens of other officers while a maniac is murdering children on the other side of the door. <laughs> if safety is your highest value, you'll give up your basic liberties, cower in your home, Wear a useless mask to signal your allegiance to the safety cult and ignore all common sense while we adopt unscientific, unconstitutional, illogical, made-up rules. Literally made up by this little elf, as Ron DeSantis would call him. That's my favorite quote of Ron DeSantis for the last two years. He wanted to kick that little elf across the Potomac. I was like, yes, man, go for it. I'm... But, but if safety is your highest value, then, you, then you'll bow to the cult in order to save your life and to live in, in this supposed safety. You know, Ben Franklin is credited with this. We don't really, really know for sure. But in, in, in 1755, there was a letter from the Pennsylvania Assembly to the colonial governor. And in that letter, we get that famous quote everybody's heard. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And I would argue if you're willing to give up your liberty for even just a perceived safety, it's not even a real safety, it's a perceived safety, then you're going to lose both liberty 
and safety. My point is this, that the American story, that we're going to hear from David Barton a little later on American exceptionalism, there is no part of American exceptionalism that happened because Americans played it safe. Every part of the American story and American exceptionalism happened because they pursued virtue and they pursued truth and they were willing to risk whatever it took in order to lift up those virtues instead of just playing it safe. I mean, Spanish flu was 25 times more deadly than COVID-19 and we managed to win World War I and not shut down our cities. I don't know how they did it. With Spanish flu, kids were getting it in the morning dead at, at midnight, far, far higher case fatality rate. And somehow America survived without the little stickers that say stay six feet apart. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they survived without $10 trillion bribing people to stay home, dumping on. I mean, somehow, some way, they managed to survive and come out of all of that even stronger than before. Why? Because they held on to their principles and they recognized government jurisdictions. The federal government did nothing with Spanish flu, didn't spend a penny, not a single penny. The President of the United States didn't even mention Spanish flu, even though he had it. Why? Because they understood that's not a federal responsibility. Back then, we followed the Constitution and recognized those jurisdictions. So we, we got to stop playing it safe. I, I, I kind of, uh, I, I realized this when I was in, um, in, in, in uh, Nevada a couple of years ago. In fact, it was right before Mark and I went and filmed it at Independence Hall, and we were doing one of our constitutional defense courses, and, and folks had come in from all over the nation, and it was a, the first event during COVID, this was, this was September 2020, and, and we had to sue the governor of Nevada just to be able to do our class. He, was trying to, he wanted us to be in, out in 113 degree weather out on the range with masks on and, uh, and six feet apart from people that had never touched a gun before us. We're teaching them how to, you know, doesn't sound very safe to me. But anyway, we sued him and uh, we were able to do our class. People are coming into the classroom crying, I mean, because we'd, everybody had been five months without fellowship and being able to be around people. It was an incredibly powerful event. And at the end of the event, my, my boys are driving back to Texas. They, they drove 25 hours each way for this class every month because they, I raised my boys right. They refused to wear a mask. And so they drove uh, 25 hours in order to uh, go to this class. I had to get on a plane to go to California to do mission work behind enemy lines. And, uh, and I get out there, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this, this, this class out there. So I'm flying to California. The boys are driving back. You know how when you split with your family, you always say, you know, be safe, safe travels, whatever it might be. And I, I typed that, be safe, as I'm about to get on the plane. And I looked at it, and I said, I am so sick and tired of being safe. <laughs> Safetyism is killing America. And I said, no, 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 we're not going to be safe. It's destroying America. Delete, 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 delete. And I said, be dangerous. <laughs> I said, be dangerous. I typed this on the spot. Be dangerous to the enemy, dangerous to apathy, and an absolutely existential threat to tyranny. Sin. Sent that to my boys. Walked a little prouder. Got kicked off my plane 20 minutes later for not wearing my mask. <laughs> but I still had a smile on my face and had a new sense of purpose in my walk. And I'm challenging you this afternoon to do the same. Meekness is not weakness. Jesus taught us power under control. He was the lamb, but he was also the lion. And we need the ability to be dangerous to those who oppose liberty. We've got to defend the defenseless. We've got to be a terror to the terrorist. And we've got to stand in the gap, even for those so clueless, they don't even realize we're at war right now for the heart and soul of America. We're fighting for them as well. This afternoon, I want you to know you are not alone in this fight. Part of the great thing about coming together like this, these coals heat up and you're able to go back home and take the principles of liberty that we know work every time they're tried. You know now, that, I mean, you've known this or you wouldn't be here, but you're part of a proven plan. This is the answer to turning this nation around. Convention of States is the solution, as Mike Ferris likes to say, big enough for the problem that we face. He's exactly right. You are part of saving America. And Patriot Academy's teamed up with you because we know we've got to train up a multi-generational movement of biblical worldview, constitutionally grounded, highly effective leaders. We're basically talking about being the men of Issachar. You remember in the Bible it talks about the men of Issachar? They understood the times and they knew what to do. See, so we can't be, you know, I mean, unfortunately, there's a lot of churches out there where, I mean, the pastors, their theology is about as skinny as their genes. It's not good. And so we can't be like that. We've got to be men of Issachar. We've got to understand the times and know what to do. We've got we've to remind people there's nothing new under the sun. There's no reason to get depressed at the things that we're facing. The laws of nature and nature's God have not changed. 
There is nothing we're facing right now that the answers are not found. In God's book, in our history, we can always look back and learn from those things. And so the reason we teamed up with COS is so that you can host biblical citizenship classes in your community where you will be planting the seeds of liberty and bringing new people in that will learn. Number one, they're not alone either. They've been thinking they were alone. And then they sit in your living room or at your church and they watch these videos with, with David Barton and Kirk Cameron and Jack Hibbs and, and Rabbi Daniel Lappin and all these people and Mark Meckler and they learn and, and they realize there are answers to what we're facing. It gives them hope and it builds your team for Convention of States right there in your community. Every time you host a biblical citizenship class, you are planting the seeds of liberty and building your local team. If you go back to that moment that we went to the week before Christmas when Thomas Paine was writing An American Crisis... He tells the story in that first pamphlet of a Tory, uh, and, and he's really, I mean, he's basically explaining the Tories were selfish, that they only cared about themselves, that they didn't care about the nation, they didn't care about the next generation, they didn't even care about their own children. And he, and he talks in there about a, a Tory that he heard over, overheard at a tavern talking about, well, as long as there's peace in my day, I'm happy. And he says, what an evil thought. A real man would say, if there has to be war, let it be in my day so that my child, my grandchild, may live in peace. And so he, he talks about how the, how the Tories only cared about themselves. And, 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 and actually, after reading that, I said, I'm going to stop asking people, what is your freedom worth? Because frankly, if you're only focused on your freedom, then you're either a Tory or a Democrat. I don't know which one. But you're probably not thinking about the next generation. So the question to ask is, what is your child's freedom worth to you? What is your grandchild's freedom worth to you? Because right now, friends, we are teetering between liberty and tyranny. And what we do through Convention of States is going to determine whether or not we fall into tyranny or we come back to liberty. This is our American crisis. We are now standing guard at the watchtower of freedom. This is the hour we get to stand in defense of all the things that our founding fathers planted here, that, that so many generations of Americans fought for. And we've been given the tools. That's the great thing about it. We're not having to just wander around in the dark and try to figure this out. You've got this great team of Convention of States with the answer, and we're teaching people all over the nation about this. I'm always learning. Every time I'm with Mark, I, I, I learn something. And I, and I remember a couple of years ago when, when I first heard him tell, and I told the story of the signing of the Declaration of Independence a million times, talked about lives, fortunes, sacred honor a million times. And the first time Mark mentioned that, that what were they pledging their lives, fortunes, sacred honor to, it hit me. I mean, I, I couldn't believe I'd never noticed that that they weren't pledging to the flag or to the Constitution or to the, to the nation or to, uh, to, to that declaration that they were signing. They were pledging to each other, and it just, I mean, ever since then, that's meant something so much more to me. And then he did it to me again last night. As, as he talked about lives, fortune, sacred honor, I've always told that story and then said, everyone here needs to give of their life, fortune, and sacred honor, but you don't have to give it all. You just got to give a little bit. All we're asking is one class a week, a couple of hours a week, a, a little bit of your fortune, just a tiny percent, start donating to Convention of States, Patriot Academy, candidates, all these things, and it's a little bit of your sacred honor. Spend some of your time standing up with honor, speaking truth, and Mark said it last night. Now, now I've got to change my whole story because I think he's exactly right. It is no longer a time where you can give a little bit of your life's fortune and sacred honor. As he said last night, we're at a point in history where now every one of us has to be ready and willing and commit that we're willing to give all of our lives, fortunes, sacred honor. That is a new level of commitment, and it's absolutely necessary for this time that we face. And the reason is because this will not be won by summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. We're not going to win this war in our nation if we're just willing to be engaged a little bit here and there. Now, I'm not saying that at, at today so you've got to sell everything you have and quit whatever job you got and all those things. But I am saying you better be prepared to give everything. You better be prepared to say, for this season, I am wholly devoted to the cause. I'm going to switch my focus to give everything I've got to make sure that we can save freedom. It's that important. And it is time for us to raise our level of commitment so that we become winter soldiers. I'm asking you to come alongside us at Convention of States, at Patriot Academy, to help us preserve and protect this torch of freedom and to purposely instill it in our children and our grandchildren. There are many people that are running around the nation saying it's, it's all over, there's no way we can win, it's too far gone, the government's too big, the, 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 the law enforcement agencies are, are too corrupt. They, they make you feel like exactly what those troops with Washington must have felt like on Christmas 1776. And yet, 
That man who was relying on godly inspiration, not worldly inspiration and what he saw with his earthly eyes, was willing to order that crossing of the Delaware. They defeated those Hessians, captured 900 of them. It became the greatest military comeback in history as his troops swelled back up to 15,000 in just a matter of a couple of weeks. Folks, Convention of States is our crossing of the Delaware. This is the moment where we must seize the day and say, on our watch, we're willing to give all of our lives, all of our fortunes, all of our sacred honor. We're willing to stand up for truth no matter what it cost us because others passed us the torch of freedom. We're going to do our part in protecting it. And I'm going to just throw out a prediction right here. If we stand for truth and we don't back down, if we do all the things that you've been hearing already today and what you'll hear tonight and tomorrow, I believe history is going to write a chapter on our generation just as we talk about those men and women in the founding era. And they're going to say on our watch, because we were willing to say, here am I, Lord, send me, I'll give it all. They're going to say of our generation that on our watch, the torch of freedom burned even brighter than it ever had before. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share with you. I just couldn't sit by anymore and do nothing. I always said I hated politics, but I found out that you can't really change things if you don't get involved. What we're looking for is somebody that uh, has the heart and wants to help save their country. It's just a, the nicest group of people that I've ever worked with.